असतो मद्गमय तमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मात गमय ओ शांति 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 ओ लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोर्टैलिटी ओ पीस 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 नमस्ते एंड गुड मॉर्निंग Nice. Very good to see you all. Good to be back here in Dallas. I always enjoy the retreats which Mataji and her intrepid band of volunteers they put together for us. This uh, weekend, the retreat that I have uh, we have conceived of is based on the Bhagavad Gita, on the thirteenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So. it has basically two parts the core is what we will talk about this morning now and in the remaining sessions after this there's another session there's one more tomorrow in the morning we'll talk about how to manifest that divinity so this goes back to swami vivekananda this simple but very profound definition of what religion is what spirituality is he said religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us now notice he did not say religion is the knowledge of the divinity within us or belief in the divinity he says it's within us and then he says it's manifestation it's already within us but it has to be manifested and this manifestation if you break it down it requires two things it has two components one is it requires knowledge it requires becoming aware of that divinity to begin with what what we truly are what is divinity and and how is it that it is within us so we must first become aware of that that is self knowledge but also one must live it one must manifest those divine qualities in life that's that's why the word manifestation is very good uh, you know there are these two types type two sides to spiritual realization one is you realize what you are the atman brahman i am pure consciousness Shankaracharya sings, "Chidananda Rupa Shivoham." I am of the nature of pure bliss. I am Shiva. I am Shiva. That realization must come. But at the same time, we expect people who are enlightened, who are self-realized, also to have some of those qualities which we uh, identify with saintly life: that love, that uh, um, serenity, that joy, that compassion, that selflessness. that control over themselves all of these things we expect what we expect in a saint if a person is enlightened all right if you have realized this you have had wonderful visions well good for you but but what do we all get out of it if you are somebody said you're the same old dude <laughs> you're still the same old guy there's something wrong with this uh, uh, enlightenment spirituality self realization so there are these two sides i like to call them one is what one might call the paradigm shift at first before all of this before vedanta i thought i am this person this body this mind this personality i am sarva priyananda who else could i be i don't even think twice about it and after vedanta my whole paradigm about myself is changed oh i am not a biological machine called this human body oh i am not even just a personality thoughts feelings emotions memories no i am something far more than that i am limitless consciousness i am existence awareness bliss satchidananda what vedanta claims that i begin to see for myself at least understand it that itself is a great 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 step forward oh this is what i am it's a huge it's a copernican revolution you know at first we thought the the universe revolved around the earth now we see everything revolves around the sun or the sun itself is moving so A, a huge paradigm shift in how we understand ourselves not body not mind i am the witness consciousness the sakshi i am limitless awareness existence consciousness bliss this is one side of it and we can call it the paradigm shift the other side of enlightenment spiritual realization is um, um what one might call ethical manifestation the 
virtues, the ethics, the saintly qualities must manifest in my life if I am to say that I have become enlightened. It must manifest, it must flower and blossom in our lives. One must not only be a blessing to themselves, but be a blessing to everybody else around. Then only we say this person is a saint, is an enlightened person, is a jivan mukta, a sthita pragya, whose wisdom is uh, settled. So there are these two sides. And today's retreat, today and tomorrow, it takes its uh, cue from what Swami Vivekananda said, the manifestation of the divinity within ourselves. Another thing Vivekananda said was, Vedanta basically has these two sides. One is the uh, divinity within ourselves, and the second one is the oneness of all existence. So Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta says, our real nature is not body-mind, our real nature is existence, consciousness, bliss, pure bliss, pure ananda, chaitanya, and the entire universe is one with you. Just the opposite of what we normally think about, about ourselves and the world. We normally think, I'm just this person, that's all. And the world is separate from me. You're all separate people. You have your own lives. This uh, entire physical universe is so vast and distinct from me. I'm just, uh, if at all, a tiny speck in the ocean of time and space. I'm just a tiny speck. This is what we think. And Vedanta forces this huge change in our understanding. No, I'm not just a little biological creature, psychological creature, social creature. I am spirit itself. I am Brahman. And this world, which seems to be a vast, indifferent material world full of other living beings, some of whom I'm indifferent to, some of whom I like, many of whom might be inimical to me. This is my worldview. That is changed. And this oneness of all existence becomes evident to me. That just as I regard this body with all its diversity to be one I and one with me, similarly, this whole universe is I, one with me. We are all one conscious being. So Vivekananda says Vedanta has these two sides. One is the divinity within ourselves. And the second one is the oneness of all existence. So this is the theme. And these two sides is what we will concentrate on in this session, what we are going to do now. What is meant by the divinity in ourselves? How do we realize that? How does it become a reality? First of all, what's meant by it? And then how do we come to see it? And second, what is meant by the oneness of all existence? Because it seems to you see how counterintuitive it seems. Whatever I think of myself, I don't think of myself as divine by any uh, stretch of imagination. And whatever I think of the world, one thing I know, it's full of diversity and difference, not oneness. It's good to say in slogan, universal uh, brotherhood or sisterhood, uh, oneness of all nations. Well, in practice, but in reality, is it really true? Already an accomplished fact that it is one, rea one spiritual reality to see that. That's a magnificent thing. And that's the vision which we shall try to attain. At least in our understanding, a shift in the understanding. And if we are lucky, an actual living uh, realization that this is so. For that, we are going to go back to the Bhagavad Gita. In the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it's one of the most remarkable chapters in the whole Bhagavad Gita, the 18 chapters, the 13th chapter. Um, one way of looking at the Bhagavad Gita is, if you divide it into three sets of six chapters each, 18 chapters. So first set, chapter 1 to 6. Second set, chapter 7 to 12. Third set, chapter 13 to 18. Many Advaitic teachers, masters have done that. On what basis? The great Advaitic teaching, Vedantic teaching, Tat Tvamasi, you are that. Uh, that means Brahman. You means the sentient being, Jiva, you and I. But I am that. That's the teaching. And he said, Vedanta, Gita says that. That's the claim. The teaching of the Gita is, you are that. And in order to understand that, first we must understand, who am I? Because when I say, I am that, you are that, what is this I? So that's one thing to understand. And that, God, ultimate reality, absolute, whatever it is, what is that? So you need to understand both. And we need to understand how they are one. And so the three parts of the Bhagavad Gita on this understanding, first six chapters is an inquiry into who am I? First six chapters into the jiva, into the sentient being, individual being. What am I? Who am I? That's one. Second six chapters from 7 to 12 is an inquiry into God. Who is God? What is God? 
and devotion to God, surrender to God. And the third set of six chapters, beginning with the 13th chapter, beginning with the 13th chapter, is where Sri Krishna brings these two together. That you are that. The identity of you and that. So this is one way of understanding the Bhagavad Gita. If you say, who's done this? Number of Advaita teachers, most notably Madhusudan Saraswati, for example, in his very profound commentary, Gurhartha Deepika, which is the, the lamp of the hidden intent, Gurhartha Deepika of the Bhagavad Gita. So, 13 chapters are important that way also, because this is where it all comes together. The whole teaching of the first 12 chapters comes together, and at the very beginning of the 13th chapter, Sri Krishna, the first two verses of the 13th chapter, where Sri Krishna teaches Arjuna, most remarkable, that's what we are going to look at now. So that's the background, the stage. What are we going to realize? Our own divinity and the oneness of the universe. On what basis, scriptural, textual basis? 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, first two verses. Then we will probe deeper into the 13th chapter in the next session and the session tomorrow also, first session tomorrow. In the beginning of the 13th chapter, um, Arjun asks this question. Kshetram Kshetragyam Yeticha uh, Prakritim Purusham Chaiva Kshetram Kshetragyam Evacha um, Gyanam Geyam Cha Keshava Etad Veditum Ichami Oh Krishna, I would like to know what is Prakriti, what is Purusha, consciousness and matter. Then he uses two interesting words. What is the field and knower of the field? Kshetra, field. Kshetragyam, knower of the field. Kshetra, field and Gya means knower. What is the field and what is the knower of the field? What is knowledge? What is what is what should we know in life? Jnanam and Gayam. So these are six questions which Arjuna puts to Krishna. And then Krishna answers. And in Krishna's answer, the next two verses, which we will do now, very dramatic, very profound. He says, Idam Shariram Kaunteya Kshetram Mitya Bhidhiyate Etadyovetitam Prahu Kshetragya iti tadvidaha. O son of Kunti, this body is the field. This body is the field. You want to know what is the field and the knower of the field? This body is the field. And the one who experiences this body from within, you who experience this body from within, you are the knower of the field. So it seems very plain. Just the body and you. So your body is the field and you, the knower of the body, the experience of the body, who is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, in, in and through that body, you exist there, you are embodied. This, to put it in Sanskrit, jiva, the sentient being. Just as we know ourselves. That is the knower of the field. And so say those the, who uh, are masters of Vedanta. They say that the body is the field and you are the knower of the field. What he is doing here is, he is starting the process of self-enquiry. He is drawing attention to ourselves and starting the process of self-enquiry. Why is it self-enquiry? Because whole of Vedanta, to realize that I am Brahman, first of all we must inquire into who I am. And this inquiry, what is this inquiry I was mentioning yesterday, those who were here yesterday, keep it real. When we inquire, the, the tendency is to make it something intellectual. Of course, we must use our intellect. Of course, we must use our power of understanding. But keep it real. Keep it real means match it, map it to our experience in life. I, I give the example of the child who was asked, what is a nose? And the child will never say nose is the organ of respiration, nose is the olfactory organ, sense organ of smell. No, the child will say nose, this. Nose. <laughs> Naak kya hai? What is the nose? This. I'm reminded of something funny which happened. Swami Sarvagatanandaji, who was in Boston. So, he was a disciple of Swami Akhandanandaji. And he told this story to us many, many years ago. It was long before the independence of India. Um, he went as a young man to Shargachi, the ashram established by Swami Akhandanandaji. And there was an orphanage there. So this young man, he was from the south of India. He had gone there and uh, he wanted to learn Bengali. And so he asked the little orphan children there to teach him Bengali. 
kids are mischievous wherever they are so they found a nice victim so they began to teach him you know say swami in bengali they would uh, he was not swami he was a brahmachari maharaj so maharaj you say this is the nose he would point out it a nak <laughs> so he learned this and they, it a kan this is the this is the <laughs> he would say nose and they would say we use the bengali word for ear this is the ear <laughs> and he learned all of it wrong <laughs> the child will point out no it means this similarly in our vedantic self enquiry when krishna says body we don't just conceptually think yes body no no body okay krishna means this when krishna says knower of the body knower of the field you look inside yes i am here whatever i am these thoughts feelings emotions this personality this is what he means always catch hold of it what he says that's the way to become enlightened if you don't do that at one point it will become very theoretical it will become it's nice theory it's a nice philosophy if you strictly hold on to your own lived experience right now who knows enlightened jeevan mukta <laughs> all right now krishna gives us the key to self enquiry very profound very simple but very powerful powerful analytic tool self enquiry is to do what the claim is we do not know who or what we truly are in order to know what we truly are we must distinguish between self and not self not nonsense not self huh? what i truly am and what i am not vedanta claims you have taken what you are not to be yourself we have taken what we are actually not we have taken it to be myself it's like the little children sometimes if you dress them up i've seen it myself with nice new clothes on a festive occasion they love the clothes so much they start crying when you try to take it up you know and when mom tries to change the dress at night it becomes so identified it's me <laughs> no it's not you we have taken something that is not us a material nature body a physiological nature prana a psychological nature even mind vedanta says dramatically you're not the body not the mind 10 years ago there was an article in the wall street journal about vivekananda the man who brought yoga to the west by any bardak she wrote this article and there she says people seem to have forgotten so vivekananda introduced the idea of yoga but his idea of yoga was spirituality she says right there all those people wearing yoga pants and huffing and puffing and stretching in yoga classes Uh, to in the search of the perfect yogic body would be surprised to if they heard vivekananda said you are not the body <laughs> and they would be even more shocked to hear when vivekananda says you are not even the mind what vivekananda meant by yoga was gyana yoga the yoga of knowledge bhakti yoga the yoga of devotion karma yoga the yoga of service and good works and raja yoga the yoga of meditation so this is the yoga of knowledge that the key to this yoga is to see what we are not what we are distinguished from what we are not so this is that will be the process and the key which the analytical to tool the knife which uh, analytical knife which krishna hands over to us is this idea the one who knows is the knower of the field that which is known is the field i'll repeat that this is the key to unlock first step you the knower the experiencer the subject you are the knower of the field and whatever you know is the field it's not you whatever we know is the field it's not us it's not our real nature we know this world yeah, we see people and places and things and activities this is all the field but krishna does not begin here because we have no problem with this uh, of mistaking this world for ourselves I I know this is a table. It's a lectern. I don't think I have no problem here. I don't think I am this lectern. A little kid might confuse. You know that take think think that the nice new dress he or she is wearing is I. But generally, we as grown ups, we don't identify the material world as ourselves. This is the field. Yes, I know it, and I don't think it is me. It's all other than me. It is this, or it is you, but it's not me. but the problem starts with this the body the moment we come to the body problem starts why 
Because clearly the body is something that is known. The body is something that is known. I see the body. Just as I see this one, I see the body. Just as I can touch this one, I can touch the body. I can smell or taste uh, like world. I can smell, taste, touch, hear, everything in the body. Even the sounds in the body can be heard. You know, tum uh, tummy is rumbling with hunger, you can hear it. One of our swamis meditating in the Himalayas, in quiet, it's very easy to even hear your own pulse, your heartbeat. So the Swami who was meditating in the Himalayas later, he said he was surprised. He would sit in the room and meditate. This is in Mayavati in the Himalayas. And he would hear this strange pounding sound. And look around, where is it coming from? Until he realized it was his own heartbeat, his own pulse. <laughs> uh, so you can hear it, the body. You can smell it. You can taste it. Touch it. See it. All five senses objectify the body. The body is known. If it's known, it's the field. It's not the knower of the field. If it's known, it's an object. It is not me. It is not I. And yet, yet, this is where we all stumble. We think of the body as ourselves. Even if I say my body, I'm not the body. It is my body. Even then, I behave as if I am this body. It is, this is where we are strongly identified. We say we are embodied. But we still behave as if I am the body. You are not the body. You are the knower of the body. You are not even the mind. You are the knower of the mind. What I mean by that is this. This is a method called Drig Drishya Viveka. The seer and the seen are different. The seer and the seen are different. The world is seen. The eyes are the seer of the world. In a very naive way. Just begin there. The world is seen. The eyes are the seer of the world. Now the eyes are distinct from what they see. Is this not true? In fact, the only thing that the eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. To see something with the eyes, you must, if it, it has something to be, that can be seeable. You can't say atoms or things like that. Whatever can be seen by the eyes must be put at some distance from the eyes in order for the eyes to see them. The eyes cannot see themselves directly. You can see a reflection of your eyes in a mirror. You can see a selfie of your eyes in a camera. But you can't, the eyes cannot, the way they are seeing this, they cannot turn around and see themselves like that. The seer and the seen are different. This points to a deeper philosophical issue. That self-reflexivity is not possible. A thing cannot operate upon itself. A knife cannot cut itself. A knife, a knife cannot cut itself. Similarly, the eyes cannot see themselves. They must. So the knower and the known, the seer and the seen, they must be different. Also note that the same eyes, they see so many different colors and shapes. Same eyes. The seer being one, the seen are various. And not only that, the eyes relatively unchanging see a very changing world. The seen may be changing continuously. The seer is relatively unchanging. Using this principle, go further. Not only the eyes, all the other senses, the body, it is the seen. And then the mind becomes the seer. The mind is the seer of the body, the eyes, ears and all. And the mind is something different from the body. Whatever the mind is, everybody, the materialist, the psychologist, the everybody, spiritualist, all will admit the mind is something distinct from the body. Only the materialist will say that that mind is being produced by the body, the brain and nervous system. But otherwise, the mind, the psychological entity we call the mind is distinct from the body which objectifies the body. So the body is the scene, body is the field, and you are the knower of the field, you the mind. But then now consider the mind. Krishna said, whatever is known is not you, it's the field. Is the mind known? Is the mind knowable? Yes. When I feel good, I have a nice feeling. When I feel sad, I feel depressed. I'm aware of my feelings. The contents of the mind are known. I'm aware of the contents of my mind. I'm aware of my thoughts. This is called introspection. Looking into my own thoughts. And aware of my understanding. I'm aware of my memory. In fact, I'm very aware when my memory doesn't work. You say tip of the tongue. It's there. I just can't recall it. As you get grow older and older, you have these senior moments. It's there. I can't recall it. So I'm aware of the functioning of the memory. I'm aware of the non-functioning of the memory. 
So all these activities going on in the mind, I'm aware of them, just as I'm aware of the body, just as I'm aware of the world. The world is an object, the field, the body, especially the field. The mind is also part of the field. It's not the knower. It's not the knower of the field. Mind in Sanskrit, body and mind are now firmly put in the category of Kshetra, object field. And you, the witness of the body, you, the witness of the mind, you are Kshetragya, knower of the field. Now immediately notice, the body is physical. The mind is mental or psychological. Then what, what is this knower of the field? Kshetragya. Question will arise. As long as I thought I was body, if somebody asked me, what exactly are you? Can you describe? I'll say I'm this physical body. There is skin and bones and organs and cells and all of that. Um, if I think of myself as a mind, I will say, yeah, what are you made of? I'm made of thoughts and memories and tendencies and personality and characteristics. But if I am the knower of the body and mind, what are you? What are you made of? What exactly are you made of? Well, two things we can say. For sure. I, the witness of the body-mind, I, the knower of the field, I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm having experiences. Notice this uh, interesting experiment. I'm going to ask you, on which side is consciousness? Awareness. We all have a vague idea of what awareness is. I'm aware. I'm conscious. I'm awake. I'm alive. On which side is it? I'm looking at the world. There is the world, field. I am the knower of the field. I am conscious of the field. Where is consciousness? If I'm forced, will I put consciousness there or here? I'll put it here. I am conscious. Now, when I'm conscious of the body here, I am aware of the body. I see the body. I feel the body. I'm aware. I'm conscious. Where is consciousness? In the body or in me, the one who is aware? I am the one. I am the conscious being. Are you following this? And following this, how? Knows. Right. You must see. This is body. And okay, I am conscious. This is like catching it like nose. So I am conscious of the body. Consciousness is on my side. Now try this with the mind. Generate a thought. Something simple. A, B, C, D. Or if you are like complexity, E is equal to MC square. Whatever thought it is. Yeah? Generate a thought. Now I am aware of the thought. A, B, C, D. Try it now. There is a thought, A, B, C, D. Say to yourself mentally, A, B, C, D. And notice, I am aware of A, B, C, D. On which side? You can open your eyes if you like. On which side? Let me ask you the question. On which side is consciousness? On Is A, B, C, D conscious or am I conscious of A, B, C, D? I am conscious of A, B, C, D. Very clearly. A, B, C, D is like mental chatter. Just mental talk. I am aware of it. So consciousness is not even in the mind. Mind means thoughts. Consciousness is on, always on my side. And I am using like light to illumine the objects which appear in that consciousness. So what am I made of? I exist and I am aware. I exist for sure. This was Descartes' great discovery. The French, we always do Cartesian um, uh, coordinates in mathematics. Do you all remember? We all studied x-axis, y-axis. So thanks to Descartes. But he was also a great philosopher. And he is well known for his Descartian cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. He set out on this project. What can be doubted? And he found everything can be doubted. It's like Matrix movie. It's all a dream. Everything can be doubted. This world, is it there? How can you doubt this world, Swami? It could be a dream. Could be a dream. Could be a hallucination. Could be a virtual reality. Notice there are virtual reality meetings also. How do I know that these, this world actually exists by itself? Not just a figment of my imagination. Similarly, everything can be doubted. Body can also be doubted. But I exist, that cannot be doubted. To doubt that also, you have to exist. So I think, therefore I exist. That was Descartes' uh, great discovery. That the one thing in this world which cannot be doubted is I, the subject. Or in Krishna's words, the knower of the field. It cannot be doubted. So there are two things which we have discovered already. You, the knower of the field. You are you exist. That cannot be doubted. This indubitable existence, existence which cannot be doubted, which is uh, does not require any certification. This world exists, it requires certification. Because I need to see it. And you can always ask, 
How do you know? I have to say, I see it, I hear it, I read about it. It requires certification. If I ask, do you exist? Yes. How do you know? So what kind of question is that? My, the knowledge of my, my existence is prior to everything and the knowledge of my existence is prior to all knowledge. So my existence, which is indubitable in Sanskrit, it is called Sat, existence, pure being. And I am conscious. This existence is conscious also. This conscious existence, it is called Sat, Chit, existence, consciousness. It cannot be doubted. It's always there. To doubt it. Suppose you doubt it. I can doubt it, Swami. Yes, even that doubt is revealed to that existence consciousness. If you were not a conscious being, even the doubt would not be possible. So all knowledge, all doubts, everything shines in that one consciousness. This is called the Kshetragya, the knower of the field. Notice, then this consciousness, one existence consciousness, which is us, is also known as, for good reasons, witness consciousness. In Sanskrit, Sakshi. Kshetragya, knower of the field. You can see why it is called witness consciousness. It is the witness of all physical and mental activities. It illumines all physical and mental activities. This witness consciousness is called Sakshi. In Sanskrit, literally means witness consciousness. Krishna calls it knower of the field. Kshetragya. All right. A little technical point here. A little technical point. The word Kshetragya, knower of the field, has been used in two senses here. One is the straightforward sense. You. Without any analysis. Without any philosophy. Without any kind of inquiry. Just me. And me means in identification with body, mind, this person, Sarva Priyananda. That's one meaning of Kshetragya. But when we start analyzing using the key given by Krishna, then we begin to see this me, this I, this knower of the field, cannot be the body. The body is the field distinct from me. Cannot be the mind. Mind is the part of the field. But the field has a physical side, the field has a mental side, but both are the field. I am the knower of the field. Then immediately this knower of the field becomes existence awareness, no longer a physical being. No longer a mental being. Body is physical being. Mind is a mental being. But I am, I wear the clothes. My outer clothes are the body, physical being. My inner clothes are the mind, mental being. But I am not my clothes. I am the witness consciousness. So now this is the second meaning of Kshetragya. Two meanings of Kshetragya. Two meanings of the knower of the field. One meaning is the straightforward jiva. Individual, sentient being. The persons, living beings, they are all knower of the field. But the deeper meaning, upon analysis, we find knower of the field, the analyzed meaning. The result of our inquiry is the knower of the field is existence consciousness. So two meanings of knower of the field, the individual being with mind and body, the, just the person, just the regular guy in the world. And the second one is witness of the body-mind with existence awareness. Two meanings. Um, and this in Vedanta, the two terms are there. Vachyartha, Lakshyartha. The literal meaning, the dictionary meaning, the straightforward meaning, just this guy. And Lakshyartha, implied meaning, the analyzed meaning. Analyzed meaning is, I am consciousness itself. I am existence itself. Is this part clear? What we are interested is in the analyzed meaning. In the inquired, the result of our inquiry. The result of our inquiry, if I take it seriously, that the knower of the field and the field are different, then I cannot be the body. I am the knower of the field. I, the knower of the field, I cannot be the body. I cannot even be the mind. The mind, the thoughts, feelings, emotions, personality. What I thought, thought myself to be, we all think of ourselves to be persons. What's wrong with that? But when you investigate the person, you will find whatever you call personality in the person is part of the field. It's not the knower of the field. The knower of the field is an impersonal consciousness. Is an impersonal awareness. Is an impersonal existence awareness. So this is the resultant culmination of our inquiry. Whichever path you follow in Vedantic inquiry, Drig Drishya Viveka, the method of the seer and the seen, you will land up there, witness consciousness. Pancha Kosha Viveka, the analysis with using the five levels of the human personality. Start with the body. Inquire. Oh, this is field. Then go to the prana. 
subtler, more inward. This is the field. Why? It is known. Then go deeper. Mind, feelings, memories, thoughts. This is the field. Why? Because they are known. Then go deeper. Intellect, the very instrument which we are using right now to analyze all this is intellect. But that also is observed. When I don't understand something, I know I don't understand it. I see it. When I get something, I also have that experience. Ah, Eureka, I got it. So the activities, ignorance and knowledge of the intellect are understood, are, are, are seen clearly. So even the intellect is a part of the field. And you push beyond the intellect. You come to a blankness. Imagine, if you ignore the external world, you ignore the body, uh, you uh, take your mind away from the breath, you st stop thinking about thoughts, feelings, memories, you stop analyzing things, just still, you come to a blankness, like deep sleep, like a simulation of deep sleep. That is called the causal body, Anandamaya Kosha, the, the sheath of the, the causal sheath. That also I am not, because I am aware of it. You are aware of the blankness, very subtle, but you are aware of the blankness. Therefore, I, the awareness, who am aware of the five layers of the human personality, physical layer, physiological layer, mental layer, intellectual layer, and the causal layer. In Sanskrit, those who know, those who have studied this, the Annamaya, the Pranamaya, the Manomaya, the Vijnanamaya, the Anandamaya, you are Pancha Kosha Vilakshana Atma, the consciousness distinct from the five layers of the human person. Same result you will get in this uh, method of five layers, analysis of the five layers, pancha kosha vichara. Or if you take another type of inquiry, avasthatraya viveka, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Again, you will come there to the witness consciousness, which is called the turiya, the fourth. The awareness associated with the waking state, I. The awareness in the dream state, there is the dreamer. The awareness which is watching the deep sleep state, associated with the deep sleep, that is the deep sleeper. And the witness, one witness consciousness of all these three states is the fourth one, the Turiya. Same witness consciousness. So whether by Drigdrishya Viveka, whether by Pancha Kosha Viveka, whether, whether by Avasthatraya Vichara, everywhere you will come to this existence awareness. I am the Sakshi. This is what Shankaracharya sings about. Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. It is awareness and it is fulfillment. It is peace. Ananda in the sense of peace. Where is trouble? Trouble is in the body. Trouble is, body is always subject to trouble. Trouble is in the mind. Even more than the body. The bodily trouble, worldly trouble, all comes into the mind. Then it becomes experienced as trouble. But the witness of the body mind has no trouble at all. Like the story I love telling. This man goes to a Swami and he says, um, in Hindi, you know, I am very miserable. And Swami says to him, are you aware of your misery? You see, Krishna's tool, if you are aware of it, it is the field. It's not the knower of the field. Are you aware of your misery? Of course. That's why I've come to you. I'm plagued by my misery. I'm troubled day and night by my misery. I'm continuously aware of my misery. Ah, if you are aware of your misery, then you are not miserable. You are the witness of the misery in the mind. <laughs> so this is such a simple but powerful insight. If you are aware of something, it is not you. It is not even yours. It is a thing which you are seeing. It is a part of the field. You say, no, it is mine. No, it is part of the field. It is an object. You are witness consciousness. You are aware of something. If you are aware of a cut in the body, and then the misery caused by that cut in the mind, you are aware of that also. Both are equally. They are objects. They are not you. In one of the books, Upadesha Sahasri, student asks Shankaracharya, that's not true. See, if you hit a um, table, I have no problem with it. But if you hit me, I feel hurt. So I can't say that the body is like the table. He uses the example of being burned. If my skin is burned, it hurts ter terribly. So how can I say it's an object? Then this is how, how deep the analysis goes. Shankaracharya says, ah, that hurt. That sensation, that burning, that pain, is that not an object too? Are you aware of it or not? If you are aware of it, it's an object. It's not in you. You are aware of it. It's an appearance in you. One powerful method, One, I've given you one powerful method of making Vedanta effective, knows. The second one, let me give you here, which will be useful. Immediately you can use it in your life. 
the method, the uh, the insight is in Hindi. I'll tell you, which I had heard, and in translate. Jo jahan ki cheez hai Mahatma ji, usko wahi rehne dijiye. Simple, a simple uh, method. Uh, the te teaching was, oh monk, keep things where they belong. Don't take upon yourself things don't, which don't belong to you. Where does pain belong? In the body. Keep it there, not in consciousness. For example, bodily problems. Oh, I'm so obese. I need to lose a few pounds. American problem. <laughs> no, not just Americans. It's now all over the world. In China, kids have the problem. In India also, it's a, it's a first world problem. It's a problem of prosperity. I'm so obese, I need to lose a few pounds or many, many pounds. Vedanta will say, wait a minute. Obese, what's obese? Is the body obese or is consciousness obese? Does consciousness weigh 200 pounds? Ridiculous. I'm aware of the body which has put on extra weight. So the obesity is in the body. Don't say, I am obese. I am the awareness which is aware of the obesity in the body. And it needs to be tackled. Fine. But I am fine. I cannot be obese. I am consciousness. How can consciousness be obese? It sounds like a silly way of thinking, but it's a very powerful way of thinking. It gives you a great amount of peace, first of all, and freedom. We take the load, not in the physical load of the obese body. We take the load of all the problems, physical problem, financial problem, social problem, relationship problems. Emotional, guilt, grief, trauma, in the mind, not in you. It gives a great relief. It will have to be dealt with. Physical problem, dealt with at the physical level. Pranic problem, dealt with at the pranic level. Mental problem, dealt with at the mental level. Intellectual problem, ignorance, dealt with at the intellectual level. But none of them are in you. You are free of them all the time. You are the witness consciousness. You are perfect as the witness consciousness. Nothing can change your nature. We are free as awareness. This free awareness, this ever-perfect, ever-shining awareness, this witness consciousness, another name for that, Vedanta is Atma, the Self. The embodied person with the body-mind, generally not called the Atma. In the Vedantic sense, the Atma, so the word Atma just means Self. It can be used everywhere. It can be used for the body also. But in the Vedantic sense, in our non-dual sense, Atma is this witness consciousness. This is what we end up with. This is the first shloka, the first answer given by Krishna. Then the next shloka is even more dramatic. This embodied consciousness, this awareness nature, I am pure consciousness, I am existence awareness. This is what is meant by the divinity of the soul, the divinity within us. What Vivekananda talked about. So our first question is answered. But then it remains, what, 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 is, what did he mean by the oneness of all existence? Clearly, it is not oneness because I am aware and I have separated everything from me. Notice, as a body, I regarded you all as bodies and the physical entities as separate from me. My identity stopped at the skin. Outside my skin, not me. Now, as an awareness, as consciousness, my identity is I am awareness and whatever I am aware of is not me. So, the world is not me. You all are not me. This, now, this body which I thought was me is also not me. Yeah, the mind is also not me. I have just shifted the margin, the border of duality, of multiplicity. I am consciousness. Everything else is separate from me. It's not oneness of the universe. Now we will go there. Second. Two questions arise here. One is that um, how many consciousnesses are there? See, something subtly what gets into our mind is that I am the witness of this body-mind. But there are so many bodies here and uh, presumably so many minds here. So in each body-mind, there must be a separate witness. If we agree to that, that is what is called Sankhya, the Sankhya philosophy. There are, yes, you are consciousness, Shank Sankhya says, you are existence consciousness. But there are many such consciousnesses, plural. In Sanskrit, that in Sankhya, it is called Purusha, consciousness. But consciousnesses are many. As many sentient beings, so many consciousnesses. This one question. How many consciousnesses? Many or one? And the second question might, might arise if you think about it. Where is God in all of this? 
we have come to a spiritual place listening to a spiritual talk you never ever mentioned god here you're going on about fields and knowers of the field where is god here is god out there different from me in that case god becomes the field or is god in here identical with me the knower of the field in that case i become god both seem very odd where is god here krishna answers both of these questions in half a verse next verse one of the most dramatic moments in the bhagavad gita I remember we are doing this, studying the Bhagavad Gita at Harvard University, in the Harvard Divinity School. And the 11th chapter was over, then 12th chapter is beginning. And the professor and the students were sitting and thinking, the discussion was, why is there a 12th chapter at all? 11th chapter is the most dramatic. Vishwarupa Darshana. So, you know, in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna shows his cosmic form. And Arjuna says, as if a thousand suns have risen in the sky. Later, Oppenheimer quoted that. When he saw the first explosion of the first atom bomb. So, so dramatic. Actually seeing the cosmic form of God, Vishwarupa Darshana. After that again by 12th chapter. It should be over. What can compare with this? But no. That is something almost physical, almost external. Very dramatic. Special effects Hollywood. But real drama is coming now. In the 13th chapter. When Sri Krishna says... Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetre shubharata. Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetre shubharata. Kshetra kshetra gyayo gyanam yattad gyanam matam mama. O Bharata, Arjuna, the prince in the line of Bharat, King, King Bharata. O Bharata, uh, Know me to be the knower of the field in all fields. Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetre shubharata. In all these billions of creatures, in all bodies and minds, there is consciousness, witness of the, 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 the knower of the field. All of them, there is one consciousness. There are not many consciousnesses. Bodies are many. Minds are many. Even the jivas are many. Sentient beings. But behind them all, illumining them all, that consciousness, which is the knower of the field, is actually one. And that one consciousness shining through all bodies and minds, that I am, Krishna says. God is that, the Vedantic idea of God is the one consciousness illumining all bodies and minds. Dramatic answer. Two questions. How many consciousnesses? One. Where is God? That one consciousness in all bodies and minds is God. This is the Vedantic idea of God. Consciousness associated with all bodies and minds. Consciousness associated with the entire universe. And that means not just physical universe, mental universe also. Here we come to the oneness of all existence. One may ask questions. Just a minute. So far it seemed very logical. But now somebody asked once. We are listening very carefully. Huh? Somebody asked. Come, 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 come on. Somebody asked. That, um, you know, till now, Swami, we were with you on the same page because it was very logical, based on logic and experience. Knows. But now you are quoting Krishna. You are quoting Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says it's one consciousness. So we have to accept it's one consciousness. Where is the logic behind it? Where is the experience? Knows behind it. <laughs> um, so yes, it's not just quoting Krishna. There is, we must dive into the depth of this. First of all, one consciousness. The Sankhyans say there are many consciousnesses. Why are you saying one consciousness? The Vedantin replies to them by turning the question around. Why do you, on what grounds, why do you say there are many consciousnesses? If you say there are many bodies, I understand. Because you can count them. Senses. If you say there are many minds in each of the body, each has different opinions, ideas. Yes, we can do an opinion poll and we see different results. But why do you say, if you distinguish consciousness, the knower of the field from the field, if you distinguish consciousness from body and mind, why are you saying there are many? Then the Sankhyan says, oh, no, no, but because it will, it makes no sense. If consciousness is one, then the birth of one will be the birth of all. The death of one person will be the death of all beings. If they are all one consciousness. The Vedantin replies, not so. Birth and death pertain to the body. It's the body which is born. It's the body which dies. Why do you think consciousness is born with the birth of the body? Consciousness dies with the death of the body? 
Even in your own philosophy in Sankhya, consciousness is not born with the birth of the body. Consciousness does not die with the death of the body. Then the Sankhyan will say, no, 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 it's, that's uh, all right. But, you know, if we were all one consciousness, um, ridiculous things would happen. For example, if one person fell asleep, everybody would fall asleep. If one person wakes up, everybody would be awake. That, that doesn't happen. Um, the Vedantin replies, again, no. Sleeping, waking, dreaming, these are conditions of the mind, not of consciousness. They are part of the field, not of the knower of the field. Even when the mind falls asleep, according to your philosophy, O Sankhyan, and ours, consciousness is ever the same. It's shining upon the sleeping mind. In one case, the mind is awake. Another case, the mind is dull, dreaming. Another case, the mind is completely asleep. Consciousness is one illumining all three. You, Sankhyan, I would agree with. That's your philosophy itself. That's what we have taken from your philosophy. Then the Sankhyan would go. These are arguments to show that there are not many consciousnesses. One consciousness. Sankhyan says, no, no, no. Um, consciousness cannot be one. For example, if they are all one, if one person becomes enlightened, all will become enlightened. So, Guru is enlightened. Then everybody will become enlightened. That would be great, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> the Vedantin says, no, that's not necessarily true. Where is enlightenment? Is it in pure consciousness or in the mind? It's in the mind. Ignorance is in the mind and knowledge also arises in the mind. Minds are different. So the guru, my guru's mind may be enlightened, but I do not have knowledge in my mind and that knowledge has to be uh, awakened in my mind. Then only I will get enlightenment. Why does consciousness have to be the same? Krishna says, Avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, vibhaktam ivachasthitam. Undivided in all beings, appearing as if divided. That appearing as if divided, we take it to be reality. No. Krishna says, actually I am undivided on all beings. But because of the presence of many bodies, many minds, I appear as if I am many. What a beautiful idea of oneness. So, the Advaitin concludes that there are no grounds for thinking consciousness by itself is many. In association with minds, in association with bodies, yes, clearly many. But by itself, bare consciousness, naked consciousness, pure consciousness, awareness itself, not many, one. I think it was Schrodinger who said, consciousness is the singular of which there is no plural. Very interesting insight from a scientist. Huh? Oh, he was very fond of Vedanta. Many of them were. Oppenheimer, Heisenberg, Schrodinger. Um, so, David Baum. One consciousness. Now, what about this world? Yes, I am one. Suppose I am one consciousness. But still, it's not oneness. Because I, the consciousness, you just said, the field is different from the knower of the field. The uh, knower of the field is different from the field. The seer is different from the scene. The eyes must be different from the things the eyes see. So difference is there. The world is separate from me. I may be one consciousness. That sounds rather esoteric. But anyway, one thing is clear. The world is different from me. How is it oneness? There are so many things. You take an inventory. So many chairs are there. So many microphones are there. So many pictures and lights are there. Thousands and millions of entities are there in this world. From tiniest particles, from quarks to quasars. How is it one? And everything is separated by time and space. How is it one? What Vedanta now wants to say is, it's pretty dramatic, he says. Next. Earlier when I said, the no, this field and the knower of the field are different. Seer and the scene are different. Don't take it too seriously. I didn't mean it. Now he will roll it back. He will say, the field is not different from the knower of the field. The field is like a dream in the knower of the field. Nothing you see in the dream. When you see things and places and people and actions in the dream, they all seem separate outside you. But when you wake up, what happens? The whole thing was first, it was all in me, not outside. Second, it was all imagined in me, in my mind. That's what the dream is. Vedanta says, this entire world of variety, of so much space and time, and it is all an appearance in you, that one consciousness. Traditional Vedanta will say, what happens? Put it in two or three sentences, the entire cosmology. This one consciousness in all beings, it, is, it has this power called Maya which projects this consciousness as the five, five primordial elements, 
space, ta- space, uh, space, air, fire, water, earth. Tasmad va etasmad atmana akasha sambhuta akashad vayu vayu or agni agni or apa adhya prithivi. Taittiriya Upanishad. This is the ancient idea that from this one existence consciousness, this itself appeared as space, material space. And this itself, not technically material space, those who have studied Vedanta will object here. But anyway, uh, then that appeared as air, that appeared as fire and water and earth, the ancient cosmology. Many ancient cultures had this air, water, fire cosmology. Basically what it means is the universe which we are experiencing as distinct and out there and apart from earth is not distinct and out there and apart from us. It's an appearance within us, which us, that one consciousness. The universe is like the dream of Brahman. We experience so many things in our dream. When we wake up from the dream, we realize one thing, that the dream was an appearance in my mind. It was not outside. Similarly, Vedanta is saying, this world, this universe, is an appearance in you, that one consciousness. Not in you, this body. Not in you, this mind. And this is the difference, those who are philosophically uh, attuned, this is the difference between Advaita Vedanta and subjective idealism. The Buddhist subjective idealist, Vigyanavadi, the Berkeleyan European philosophy, Berkeleyan subjective idealist. They say that matter exists in the mind. You know, the old philosophical joke, you go into class, any philosophy class, the first joke you will hear. <laughs> what is matter? Never mind. What is mind? No matter. <laughs> The Berkeleyan, out of, after whom Berkeley is named actually, Bishop Berkeley, and the Berkeleyan subjective idealist says that the world is a dream in my mind. Just like I dream at night, similarly the world is a dream, it's in my mind. Vedanta does not say that. Vedanta says the world, the mind, all of that are appearances in one consciousness. Not in individual mind. Individually you are separate from the other individual. Your body is separate, your mind is separate. But as with this consciousness, the entire universe is an appearance in me and therefore does not constitute a second reality apart from me. Suppose in your dream, you walked in a, in a mall and you saw thousands of shops, I mean thousands of items in shops and hundreds of people in the mall. You see hundreds of people and you wake up from your dream. How many were there? How many are there now when you wake up sitting on your bed? I, one, alone. And in the dream, when you were seeing hundreds of people, how many were there actually? How many were you seeing? Hundreds. How many were there actually? I must admit only I was there. Not even that person in the mall, the dreamer who was lying on the bed and dreaming. Only that one was there. So even while seeing hundreds or thousands, I admit there's only one. Similarly, the claim is here. In consciousness, since the universe is an appearance in consciousness, though it appears to be billions of people, it appears to be so many stars and planets spread out across unimaginable time and space. It's only all one consciousness appearing as its own object. We can explore this. This is a very, very tre- a tremendous claim to make. We can explore this at some depth in question answer if you want to ask about this. So the universe does not constitute a second reality apart from uh, you, the consciousness. The universe, the field is not a second, it's not separate, it's not a second reality apart from the knower of the field. See, there's a subtle point here. One sadhu put it very beautifully, monk. Originally, it was claimed that the seer and the seen are different. Now it seems you're changing it. First we said, seer and the seen are different. Now it seems you're saying the they are not different. The sadhu said, Drashta to drishya se alag hai, so thik hai Mahatma ji. The seer is different from the seen. That is correct. We still stick to that. Then he said, Lekin kab, kabhi aapne socha hai, kya dr- drishya drashta se alag hai? Is the seen separate from the seer? Let me rep- rephrase that. Let me repeat that. It's very subtle but very uh, uh, amazing point which slipped us. The Seer, you the seer, you are separate from the seen, that's correct. We hold on to that. But have you ever thought, is the seen separate from you? The knower of the field, Krishna said, the knower of the field is separate from the field. 
But he never said that the field is separate from the knower of the field. What does that mean? If one thing is separate, if A is separate from B, then B must be separate from A. You're saying that A is separate from B, but B is not separate from How is that possible? The paper is separate from the lectern. The lectern is certainly separate from the paper. Sometimes you see them together, but how do you know they are separate? What is the test? Can you show them separately? I can show you. You can experience the paper without the lectern. And you can experience the lectern without the paper. Hence, they are separate. Even if you can put them together, it's still separate. But let me ask you, the wood and the lectern, are they one or are they separate? Well, one, but also not. Because you can experience the wood without the lectern. At one point, it was a log of wood. Now you make it into a particular shape. And then one day it might be destroyed. It will still be pieces of wood. The wood was there earlier. The wood is there. Now wood will continue to be. The lectern is a name, form, and activity, function imposed in between. What I'm saying is the wood is separate from the lectern. But the lectern is not separable from the wood. I can show you the wood separately from the lectern. Not now. I'd have to break the lectern. And, but the lectern, this one, you can't show separately from the wood. You can't. Similarly, the, con the, the universe, the objects of the world, the, you, the consciousness, you are separate from what you experience. But what you experience is not separate from you. Aap drashta, you are the seer. You are separate from the drishya, the scene. But the scene are not separate from you. Good example is the dream. You exist without the dream. You were there before you dreamt. You were there during the dream. After you wake up, you are still there. But what you dreamt about, they do not exist without you. It's only when you are dreaming. Those people, those objects, those places, they appear only when I am dreaming. Stop dreaming, they are gone. But I continue. I am not gone. I, the dreamer, am separate from the dream. But the dream, the objects of the dream, the people in the dream, they are not separate from me, the dreamer. It's because I am appearing as that. Now a deeper point, and I'll stop there. I said, I can show you the wood separately from the lectern. But I'll have to break the lectern and show you wood separately. But now I'm saying, now while the lectern exists, I can show you the wood separately from the lectern. In fact, I cannot show you the lectern at all. How? Look, when I say, touch wood. I never say touch lectern. We all say touch wood. Because we know instinctively, this is wood. Where is wood? This is wood. This is wood. The side is wood. The bottom is wood. All of it is wood. It's a, but it's the lectern. Show me the lectern. Whatever you show me will be the wood. So this one is the lectern, right? No, this is the wood. If the two words, lectern and wood. Some of you look puzzled. It's a subtle point, but, but quite dramatic. The two words, lectern and wood. I can show you what corresponds to the word wood, this one. You can weigh it, you can touch it, you can see it. Show me what corresponds to the word lectern apart from the word wood. You can't. You say, but the shape is the lectern. The shape, does it exist apart from the wood? But the function is the lectern. You put the paper on the lectern. But can you have that function without the wood? The lectern certainly is a name and a form and a function, but that form and function are entirely dependent on the underlying wood. And the name is given to that form function with the underlying wood, but never apart from it. You cannot show. In fact, if you try to experience the wood here, through and through you will find it is wood. Apart from that wood, if you try to experience the lectern, you won't find anything at all. You have two words, but not two entities. Think about it. People will say, no, it is both. Okay, so it's wood, but it's also both. But you have to be a little bloody-minded here. Uh -huh. um, philosophers have to be very ruthless. Both. Both means two. Show me two. Separately, show me two. You can't. Why not? Because it's one reality. The other one is a name and a form. And a function. Vedanta says, the consciousness, which Krishna says, I am the one consciousness in all fields. The fields are nothing but name and form and function. The one reality through and through, in the seer and in the seed, is that one consciousness. And that consciousness is Krishna. But he said in the first 
Shloka, it is you. You are the knower of the field. It is you. The real you is the one limitless consciousness, this ocean of consciousness appearing as time, space, oceans of time, oceans of space, oceans of matter. But they are all this one consciousness and it is you. And then you have injected yourself into this dream and occupied one body and mind. I am a little fellow. I am in search of moksha. I want this. I want that. I have many troubles. I have a long list of complaints. You don't know my sufferings. You are the one God of this universe. Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetre shubharata. O Bharata, I am the one consciousness in all beings, Krishna says, and I am you. So this is the final conclusion. The non-dual, one non-dual consciousness. This is called the oneness of all existence. Just before we end, I'll take a few seconds. Just occurred to me how these Advaitins play with words. Bharata, one of the commentators, Shankarananda. Bharata, the word used for Arjuna throughout Bhagavad Gita. Krishna calls him, hey Bharata, oh Bharata, oh uh, prince in the line of Bharata. No, the king, uh, line of um, kings from which the name of India also has come, Bharata. This commentator called Shankarananda, writing about 500 years ago, he has written a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. There he says, Bharata means the one who delights in Brahma Vidya, in the knowledge of Brahman. Bha, the word Bha means light of consciousness. Light as consciousness. Consciousness is light. Bha. And Ratha means one who is delighted in, one is completely, con con continuously engaged in. So if you are a serious spiritual seeker trying to realize I am Brahman, you are Bharata. And civilization also, that I think it's pretty appropriate. Here is a whole civilization who for 5,000 years has been engaged in this quest of who am I, what am I, what's the ultimate reality, spiritual reality, can we transcend sorrow. Okay, on that grand note, Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Questions, most important. Please come up, make a cue there. The microphone is going to you. Now we covered the entire range of the central teaching of Advaita Vedanta. The divinity within us and the oneness of all existence. So there can be any number of questions. All right. We have got four people there. Let's stop there. We'll take questions in the next session again because I don't think we can handle all the questions before we're running out of time. Yeah. Swamiji, uh, thanks for the uh, excellent Tell us your name. My name is Kamesh Namaduri. Yeah, thanks for the wonderful lecture. I've been um, I enjoyed thoroughly as I did so, so many lectures before, from you before. Uh, one thing, a small uh, example I want to give. I was teaching uh, what is a vector to my kid, and she told, no matter after one hour, she said. You, you're telling me all about vector, but you're not telling me exactly what is a vector. Oh. So here, after listening to so many lectures, reading so many books, all I could come up to is probably what consciousness is, just a blank, but it is alive. So it looks like, you know, you're going, you're getting infinitesimally closer to what it is. Oh. And also I feel happy and lighter after all this reading and even after meditating, but is it, will it remain like an enigma forever? No, it will be, it is not an enigma. It's, it's straightforward and very clear. But why it remains like an enigma, what you said is very uh, interesting. You're getting infinitesimally closer and closer to it, approaching it, but it seems to be something in the limit, not uh, graspable. Never do that. Why? We are trying to make it an object. What you're trying to do is make it the object of my most sophisticated intellectual understanding, finer and finer and finer intellectual understanding. That's why you get the feeling I'm getting closer. You are getting closer. But will you approach it in the limit? No, you will not. Because you are it. Ah, this, we must give up the objectifying tendency. First of all, how will you give it up? First of all, know that you have found it. Found it as what? I am that. Stop the seeking. Now what you do is, Instead of trying to seek it, instead of trying to approach it infinitesimally, ever closer, never reaching it, <laughs> that's the problem. Instead of trying to do that, what we should try to do is 
that which I have an incorrigible tendency of trying to identify myself with. I am now very clear. I am not those things. I am not the table. I am not the shirt. I am not the body, not the prana, not the mind, not the intellect, not even the blankness beyond the intellect. There I should be careful. That my effort now should be to make myself very clear I am none of those. Then what I am will be self-luminously, without any effort on my intellectual, uh, without any intellectual effort, without any mental effort. It will manifest. It is already manifesting itself. In fact, at that level of deep understanding, this continuous attempt to understand or hold on to the Atman is a big obstacle. What will happen there is, we will never get it that way as an object. And then we will be continuously plagued with, yes, I know it is surely it exists, but it seems very vague. Or sometimes we may get this idea, it doesn't exist. Shunyam, blank, nothing. No, no, it does exist. That vague understanding which I have got, but very close and I'm getting some peace and happiness, I am the witness of that understanding also. And be at peace being the witness. Don't try to grasp the witness by the witness. Just as we cannot see the eye by the eye, the witness cannot objectify itself. But it need not. You cannot objectify yourself. You need not. You must not objectify yourself. You need not. Once you realize what it is, peace. Thank you, Swamiji. Today is my dream come true. Finally, I was able to, I'm able to come and meet you in person. Thank Tell you so name. much. Um, I have one question. Um, sorry. Name. Aravinda. Aravinda. My name is Aravinda. Um, the knowledge we gather is stored as memory. And even um, the knowledge of me, myself, Irene, that's also a memory. So I'm, I'm just memory, that's all. So there is nothing beyond that. Hmm. So, with that in mind, is knowledge really required to find the truth? If not, why can't I just drop everything right now and focus on what is, so that my mind doesn't distort it? Hmm. All right. First of all, I'm only memory, only in one sense. The story about myself is memory, stitched together from memory and imagination and all of that. Uh, but I am not only memory. For example, it's, I'm not remembering things all the time. Especially when I am say when I fall asleep, deep sleep, no thought, no memory, no idea, no perception, no judgment, but I am as the witness of that deep sleep. When memory arises, I am the witness of the memory. When memory falls fails to arise, I am the witness of the failure of that memory. When false memories arise, we don't we know, we are not aware of how delicate and unreliable our memory is. If my idea of myself is based on memory, then it's almost certainly a false idea. There's a book, look it up, Seven Deadly Sins of Memory. Seven Deadly Sins of Memory. Some three of them are sins of commission, three of omission, like that. Four, three or four ways in which we four ways in which we forget, and three or four ways in which we actually introduce false ideas into our memory of ourselves or whatever. So memory is a powerful, is a wonderful tool, but wholly unreliable and in any case it's not you it tells tales but it's not you you are the witness of the memory now what does knowledge do what knowledge does is it removes ignorance in one sense you are right if you drop everything the reality that one shining consciousness we are talking about it's there it's right now it's right here like nose actually behind the nose anyway not behind everywhere it is and the nose is an appearance in consciousness. But anyway, it's very close. It's more intimate than the nose. It's more intimate than the mind itself. My, my own existence. But memory is an appearance in that. We don't need to depend on memory. Our problem is confusion arises about this. And the result of that confusion is, I think I am body. I think I am mind. Then maybe I give a lot of importance to memory. It's all a result of not knowing myself as I am. Once that knowledge of myself as I am arises, as I am is always shining forth. I don't need to rely on memory there. It's not that I have to now carefully remember my Vedanta class at every moment. I must make an effort to hold on to that. That's a good practice initially. Ultimately, it will not be necessary. I remember in a group of sadhus in Haridwar, we were sitting and discussing, this teacher who was teaching, one young monk said, he was telling us to drop everything. And then the, this one young monk said, 
I'll tell you in Hindi and translate. Lekin aam brahmas pe isko to pakad ke rakhna hai. But I am Brahman. With so much effort I have understood this. At least this much I should hold on to, right? This is the, I finally got the truth. I must hold on to I am Brahman. And then the monk said, listen to this. The monk said, the teacher said, Usi ko to nahi pakad ke rakhna hai. That's what you must not hold on to. Why is that important? See, your identity as Aravind. Do you practice it? Do you hold on to it? Morning one hour Aravind meditation, one evening one hour. Otherwise, slowly it may fade away. I may forget. It may disappear. No, you're fully confident that the Aravind identity is present. But even that is superimposed because that's a name given by your parents. That has become so effortless for you. Similarly, my own self is the effortless self. It, this at one time it will become like that. So not depending on memory, not even depending on understanding. At one time Alzheimer or something may happen, no memory may go away. My sharpness of mind trying to understand all this using Vedanta, philosophy and all, that sharpness also may go away. It's not me, it's an instrument. I said this once to a professor and he said, Swami, our faculty, professors, they all need to hear this. As time goes, younger, smarter people come. My own faculties, my own memory, my own intelligence begins to deteriorate. Age will do that. And then depression. Because my whole investment was in my intelligence. I am the sharpest cookie. I am the block. But now there are newer cookies, better than me. And my own initial sharpness also is going away. Depression. A great philosopher once told me, that I'll tell you this little story, two, three minutes. Uh, one philosopher, very well-known philosopher, both East and West, he was in the US for a long time. He told me he had a stroke at one time, um, mild stroke. He was telling me, this was about the 19, late 1990s. He said, you know, Swami, I'm, I feel I'm slowing down. I can't remember as well as I used to remember. And I'm not as quick on the uptake as I was. And uh, I am getting this depression, feeling unhappy. Yeah, I trying to recall the date, not that so important. I so early two thousands. Yes, I was already a swami at that time. Then I remembered a similar incident. One great monk whom I knew, public did not know him of him too well. Swami Mokshadanandaji, Ram Maharaj. He was our teacher when we were brahmacharis, briefly. And I saw him for the last few years of his life when he was quite sick in, in our main monastery in India, near the Ganga. Uh, very great. One of the greatest Vedanta scholars I have seen. I used to always, not just me, many of the monks. He was sort of a hidden treasure. We used to go, we, whatever questions we had in Vedanta, we would take it to him. He is one of those few Go to persons. I would go with my questions also. Now this wonderful Swami, always with a twinkle in his eyes, in spite of his illness, always happy, peaceful, caring, uh, very incisive. One day I went to him with a question, at, almost at the very end of his life. And I asked him a question and he thought and thought and he said, see. In Bengali I'll tell you what he said and then I'll translate. He said, I couldn't have money and nowadays I can't recall all that stuff, which he had spent a whole lifetime learning. And then he says, Oh Jack, or Kaj with a big smile and twinkle in his eyes. He says, Let it go, its work is done. Uh -huh. Now, one is I have worked very hard to accumulate knowledge, my papers and books and my understanding and my classes and my courses. That's my treasure. Like a person working in Wall Street acquires millions and millions of dollars. And then maybe in a flash, one day, Wall Street crash, he loses it. I know people who have lost 100 or 200 million dollars, but they have many more hundreds of millions of dollars, so they have no problem. But So you can lo lose it. You know, it's like that. Uh, I lose all my, or most of my knowledge and understanding. I'm, it's like a great deal of it is no longer accessible to me because of the stroke. How will you feel? So depression. But this person, this monk does not feel that. His lifelong learning is no longer, it's actually not working anymore. Brain is not working so well anymore. But he has no depression. Why? He says, let it go. Its work is done. What was its work? 
There was a dark cloud over the sun. A gust of wind came and removed the dark cloud. Now I'm enjoying the sun. The dark cloud of ignorance was there. The wind of Vedanta came and removed that ignorance. Now let the wind go away. I'm enjoying the sun. Of, of uh, Sun is my own self. That's ever available, ever shining. Do I want it always to be windy? No. Yeah. Come near, near to the microphone. Namaskar. Thank you uh, for this privilege. Uh, really blessed to be here today. Uh, my question is, um, my name is Archana, and my question is, uh, how do we view Dvaita philosophy through the lens of Advaita? Because mm. everywhere you see there is uh, idol worship, and we have also heard stories of uh, Sri Ramakrishna interacting with uh, God Kali. As a real person, hmm. is it just an appearance in consciousness, or hmm. okay? How do you separate the two? Yes. So let me first give you the straightforward answer, and little then dive a little deeper into Adv Advaita Vedanta. Now, um, traditional Advaita Vedanta will say that the Advaita philosophies. There are multiple schools of them. Dvaita Vedanta, Vishishta Dvaita, Chintya Veda, Veda, multiple philosophies. And the broader scale, in one sense, many traditions in Hinduism, in Christianity, Islam, they are dualistic. There is God separately, in some degree of separation, and we are there separately. Now, the Advaitic response to these, Gaudapada, Shankaracharya's Guru's Guru, is it? Parasparam Virudhyante Te, they fight among each other, but we have no quarrel with any of these philosophies. Why not? They think we are their enemy. We don't think they are our enemy. Why not? Now the answer, twofold answer is there. One is the traditional Advaitic answer from Shankaracharya, which will make the dualists wild, furious. But one is much more beautiful and accommodating answer from Sri Ramakrishna. The traditional Advaitic answer is, we have no conflict with these dualistic philosophies. Why? Because, Shankaracharya says, it's like a man riding on an elephant. Remember, he was from Kerala. So there are many elephants in the... So riding on an elephant and some, somebody, a, a crazy man comes in front of the elephant on the ground and says, charge your elephant against my elephant. We will have an elephant fight. And this man says, it's not possible because you don't have an elephant. So there is no conflict possible between Advaita and Dvaita because there is no conflict possible between reality and appearance. <laughs> the truth has no conflict with any appearances. The dualistic philosophies, yeah, they, they are in the realm of, uh, transactionally they may be useful. Ultimately, the truth is the truth of non-duality. And how, what, conf what conflict could it have? Yeah. So from that perspective. And that's not something that will make the dualistic philosophers happy at all. <laughs> Who wants? <laughs> Or another example is used. Swami Tapasyanji says this. He has a, school, a book, Bhakti Schools of Vedanta. This is, Advaita is often presented as, yes, Bhakti is alright, but it's like the base camp of the Everest and the peak of the Everest is the non-dual. So at the base camp, your preparatory, it might be nice to have some dualistic practices. You might have temples and worships and conceive of God as separate from you and worship God. But ultimately you have to climb to the peak, which is non-dualism. And in this way, we accept the dualistic schools. So Swami Tapasyanji says that's a little condescending. Who wants to be in base camp all their life? They all want to ascend. And if you say that only my philosophy is at the top and yours are all base camp. So these are two traditional ways of looking at dualistic philosophies from an Advaitic perspective. They are they're not mistaken, but they are uh, all right from their perspective. Uh, but not the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is non-duality. Now, Sri Ramakrishna's perspective. Sri Ramakrishna says, the goal is to attain the truth in some way or the other. The five blind men touched the elephant and they thought the elephant is some thought like a pillar, some thought like a rope, some thought like a, uh, like a pipe, They're, or like a fan. They were touching different parts of the, the legs, the tail, or the ear, or the trunk of the elephant. But they were all touching the elephant. Now, their mistake was thinking that the whole elephant is like this. Similarly, you might conceive of the dualistic philosophy touching the reality and conceiving of it as God, Father in heaven, Vishnu, Kali, and I am the devotee. That's fine. You have touched the reality. 
And Advaitin saying that I am this one limitless consciousness, existence consciousness place. He put it in another sweet way. In India, there's this sweet we make called pitha, that is pithe, uh, you know, like a like a pie. And he says the pie, the goal is to eat the pie. You can eat it like this, you can eat it like this, you can turn it around and eat it like this, but you're eating the same pie. It's not that one is eating the real pie, another one is eating a false and a pie. No, it's the same reality. So the devotee, or the one on the path of knowledge, one on the path of bhakti, they can all they are all ultimately touch the same reality, and that's good enough. It's not even that the devotee has to go to non-duality to become fully enlightened, which the Advaitin would insist on. It's good you are devotees, but you must come to Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman for that realization. From my perspective as an Advaitin, it makes perfect sense. That is a lower grade, this is a higher grade. But that's just because of my perspective. You have, you have taken this perspective, you already made up your mind. Ignorance is the problem, we are already one with Brahman, and we have to realize we are Brahman, inquiry is the way. All of this we have already made up, and then the result is automatic that the Vedanta, the non-dual Brahman will be the highest, no doubt about it. But this is one perspective. Other perspectives are also possible. These perspectives are all intellectual constructs. And the Advaitins know this. Gaurapada himself says, Advaita michanti kechan, Advaita michanti chapare, Advaita Advaita vivarjita tattva. Some prefer non-duality. He's a great non-dualist, Gaurapada. Some prefer duality. But the fact is, reality lies beyond duality and non-duality. But that one can't be expressed by language. Have, at most, you can go up to non-duality, but not beyond that in language. Uh, so, yes, this is the... Hi. Uh, yeah. Thank you for coming Last to question. Dallas. Uh, uh, um, my question is, uh, with regard to the consciousness, the perceiver, who we are, and what... and and. The secondary, the uh, the dream, matter, uh, whatever we're going to call it, is consciousness producing the dream, uh, producing that that which is what we perceive, and what is the why uh, is that? Like, right, why does right. such a dream exist? All right. The second question: Why does it exist? Is a big question. I will not answer it right now because we have run out of time. But the first question: Let me just touch upon it. The question was subtle that what is the causal relationship between consciousness and its dream, the objects which we perceive, I, the consciousness, and what I perceive? And different philosophers will give different answers. The materialist will say, what you perceive is reality, is out there. And you, the consciousness, you are a product of bodily processes, brain, nervous system, and all. And then you are perceiving uh, the external world. This is the materialist. Idealist philosophers will say, what you are perceiving is in consciousness. Yeah. They are objects in consciousness. They appear in consciousness, though uh, we think that they are outside us. Now the question is, why or how does consciousness produce these things? And the Advaitic answer is, it doesn't. Production means there is a cause which becomes an effect. There is a wood which is transformed, which is made into a lectern. There is uh, seeds becoming a plant. Consciousness never becomes anything else. Notice in our own experience, go back to the nose, go back to our own experience as conscious beings. Notice whatever we experience in consciousness is basically in consciousness. We don't, in consciousness, there are there is no wood or steel or even thought. There are just appearances in consciousness. Consciousness, remaining consciousness has these appearances which it experiences. Look at it phenomenologically, in psychologically, in our own experience. Do we see a consciousness transforming into something else? Or just consciousness experience? Consciousness shines and it experiences. It does not transform into the object. That's a subtle answer and quite radical answer. Answer to your question. Why or how does consciousness produce these uh, objects which it is experiencing. Answer is, it does not produce the objects. That's the very nature of an appearance. For example, this can be produced from paper and made into this, from trees and made into this paper. But when I imagine this uh, in the mind, to imagine it also requires some amount of effort. 
you know, memory has to be pulled in and then I have to visualize it. But this imagined product, when it shines in the mind, that consciousness which illumines it, which experiences this imagination, that consciousness did not become a piece of paper. A piece of paper is an appearance in consciousness. And the claim here is, whatever we are experiencing are appearances in consciousness. Not consciousness becoming something else. Not consciousness producing something else. There is no producer-produced relationship between consciousness and objects. There is preliminary, the illuminer and illumined, seer and seen relationship to pre preliminary. And if you go further, there is no relationship between consciousness and its objects. The objects are nothing but consciousness, appearing to be objects. All right. On that other enigmatic note. <laughs>